our next speaker is uh, Dr. Andre Lieber from the University of Washington here in Seattle, where he's a professor in the Department of uh, Medicine. He'll talk to us about uh, the use of adnoval vectors for in vivo delivery. Thanks so much, Andre. Okay, thank you. So HSC gene therapy has delivered cures for a, a number of diseases, including inherited immunodeficiencies and uh, certain forms of thalassemia. The standard protocol that is currently used uh, involves the collection of hemopoietic stem cells, their in vitro culture and transduction with a lentivirus vector, and then retransplantation or transplantation back into myeloablated or myeloconditioned patients. Uh, this protocol has a number of shortcomings. Uh, collecting HSCs is not a trivial procedure. Culture of HSCs over a longer uh, time period actually can result in loss of pluripotency, which uh, then again affects uh, 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 engraftment rates and uh, duration of a therapeutic uh, response. But the most critical problem is that you have to myeloablate or myelocondition uh, patients. And in the case of hemoglobinopathies, which I will talk about later, this can actually lead to mortality. The procedure is highly complex and can only be performed at specialized centers, so it's not portable, uh, which uh, is a major limitation to a widespread uh, 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 application of, of this kind of gene therapy. Plus, it comes with a hefty price tag. Uh, Strimvelis, a skid ADA drug sold in Europe, uh, costs $800,000 per patient. And Bluebird Bios, uh, Lendiglobin technology for thalassemia costs $1.8 million per patient. Clearly out of reach for resource-poor countries. <clears throat> So we uh, developed an in vivo approach which avoids uh, HSC collection, uh, culturing, transplantation, and myeloablation. The idea is to use standard drugs uh, to mobilize hemopoietic stem cells from the bone marrow uh, and get them into the periphery. Uh, while they are on the periphery, we uh, inject a virus that has been specifically designed to target primitive hemopoietic stem cells. And transduced hemopoietic stem cells would then return back to the bone marrow where they persist long term. So this procedure is clearly uh, simpler. Uh, <clears throat> it involves only subcutaneous and intravenous injections. Uh, we uh, choose a vector, and I will get into this later, which is easy to produce, uh, uh, easy and cheap to produce. Um, so the vector at this point is a chimeric vector. It has an at five, zero type five capsid with uh, uh, zero type 35 fibers. We have introduced mutations uh, uh, within this fiber knob, which is the receptor interacting moiety. Uh, to increase affinity to CD46, which is our target receptor. And CD46 is an interesting molecule because it's highly upregulated on primitive hemopoietic stem cells compared to more differentiated cells or, or cells in solid tissues. These vectors are gutless or gutted, so all viral genes are removed. So we have a lot of space for transgenes up to 35 KB. There are no adaptive immune responses. And again, it's up it's very simple to make these vectors. Uh, it does not require large-scale plasmid transfections like AAV or lentivirus. And the procedure takes six hours of work, basically, and, and costs per patient, based on estimates from my lab, about $3,000. The virus is stable, can be lyophilized and shipped, and we can make the virus uh, uh, as episomal vector or uh, uh, as integrating vector. So I would like to touch shortly about the three main components of our approach and then get into a, a, a few examples of application. <clears throat> so uh, within the bone marrow, hemopoietic stem cells are in tight contact with uh, stromal cells and with, stromal, uh, with ECM proteins. So they are not accessible to intravenously injected uh, uh, viruses or ligands. 
they are also difficult to transduce by intraosseous injection because of this tight uh, stroma inside the, the bone marrow. So one way to get them out from the bone marrow is a, is a mobilization approach that is currently used to collect hemopoietic stem cells for transplantation purposes. It involves uh, GCSF and AMD3100, uh, which is a CXCR4 uh, antagonist. So we use this approach in most of our studies. There are alternative, more elegant uh, uh, options here that would avoid GCSF, which actually causes a quite huge leukocytosis. In mice, the combination of uh, GCSF and AMD3100 would uh, mobilize hemopoietic stem cells, and you see them here in the periphery uh, as LSK cells. The increase of these LSK cells was about 50-fold. There is a certain time window of about, with a peak at one hour, and then they return back to the bone marrow. In macaques and humans, the kinetics is slightly different. Uh, it's slower. So you have a peak of mobilization around eight hours. This is usually when the stem cells are collected to up to 11 hours. So now, uh, in mice, we would uh, inject our virus uh, at a one hour at the peak of mobilization. And here we just use a simple GFP virus to follow transduced cells over time. Uh, the light blue color shows here transduced uh, hemopoietic stem cells present in the periphery at two hours after virus injection, and we transduce about 15% of, of circulating uh, mobilized HSCs. So by day three, these marked cells go down, and they appear on the bone marrow and in the spleen, which is a secondary hemopoietic uh, organ. As I mentioned earlier, there is a preferential transduction of more primitive cells, which are uh, uh, present in LSK cells compared to more differentiated cells, and this has something to do with the density of CD46. Uh, it's higher on primitive cells than on, on differentiated cells. So Hans Peter's group a couple of years ago did a study in monkeys where they also used GCSF AMD3100, and they saw a similar thing. They saw at six hours, 3.8% uh, of CD34 plus cells, hemopoietic stem cells in the periphery transduced. And these cells, transduced cells, then appeared in the bone marrow at day three at a similar rate. Interestingly, again, if they looked at more primitive cells, which in our case, uh, case uh, are colony forming units, they saw transduction rates of up to 50%, again, indicating there's a preferential transduction of primitive cells. Vector administration, and I will talk mostly here about safety issues. <coughs> uh, Many years ago, we did a study with Hans-Peter in baboons where we injected a first-generation uh, 535 vector intravenously, and we looked for transgene expression three days later, and we did not see major transgene expression in all tissues except for the spleen. There's a certain subfraction of uh, macrophages that is susceptible to transduction. And we saw something similar now in our model where we have uh, mobilized mice and where we use our uh, affinity-enhanced helper-dependent at 535 vector. So there's no significant transduction of non-blood cells after IV injection, no vector genomes in germline tissues. This shows liver sections transduced with a standard zero type 5 vector, uh, and this transduction is mediated actually by coagulation factors which, which, uh, get, uh, uh, which bind to the virus and actually mediate transduction of hepatocytes. We don't see this with our HD at 535 vectors. So correspondingly, there is no transaminitis compared to at 5 Every vector, viral vector, or even nanoparticle that is injected IV for gene transfer purposes uh, triggers uh, innate immune responses. And innate Im immune responses are mostly characterized by a cytokine release or cytokine production. Uh, for adenovirus IL-6, is a key player. It peaks around six hours after intravenous injection. The pathway how IL-6 is induced is very well known. 
for adenovirus very well studied. Uh, it is triggered by uh, endosomal release of the capsid, but also by sensing of incoming t uh, DNA by uh, toll-like receptors and then activates NF-kappa B. Another main player in this pathway is uh, IL-1, which actually precedes uh, activation of IL-6. There are a number of drugs available to interfere with this uh, activation of, uh, of cytokines and innate immune responses. So in mice, a simple pretreatment with dexamethasone before we inject our virus here uh, completely plundered any uh, cytokine response. So the dotted lines are basically the detection levels. In the monkey, it's more complicated. In an earlier study that Hans Peter did, a relatively low dose uh, of dexamethasone given before virus uh, allowed that this injection was tolerated. However, serum IL-6 levels were in a critical range here. Uh, so in a recent study that we started 10 days ago, we uh, first of all increased the steroid concentration and we added an IL-6 receptor uh, antagonist tocilizumab. And this brought down IL-6 responses. Uh, correspondingly, at the peak levels, IL-6 serum levels are about 20-fold lower than compared to this previous studies study. And the monkey was perfectly fine. So uh, there's clearly some room to go here, but I think we are able to control an innate immune response to intravenous injection of our virus. Um, in vivo selection, okay. So, um, in vivo transduced hemopoietic stem cells cannot efficiently compete with non-transduced cells in the bone marrow, resulting in a slow egress of gene-modified differentiated cells. To self solve this problem, we employed an in vivo uh, selection approach that was developed by Hans Peter's lab. It involves a mutant of MGMT that we would put in our vector. And this protein would then uh, create resistance to O6BG, BC, and U. So cells that are transduced would be resistant to these drugs. This is our standard in vivo selection, tra transduction selection approach. We would mobilize uh, hemopoietic stem cells, inject our vector, and then four to eight weeks later, we would, inject, we would start in vivo selection. And this is the result here. We have a GFP vector. So we are looking at the percentage of GFP positive cells and PBMCs. Before selection, they were around 10%, uh, but uh, immediately after selection, they came up to 80% of gene marking. And you see marking in all lineages uh, at a comparable level, indicating that selection occurs at a progenitor level. And it is continued and maintained in secondary recipients. So we collect uh, bone marrow cells here and transplant them into uh, irradiated, uh, lethally irradiated uh, secondary recipients and follow transgene expression. In terms of applications, so over the last couple of years, we made about 30 different vectors. Uh, some of these vectors uh, were meant to uh, integrate uh, and we used here two mechanisms. The first mechanism is a sleeping beauty transposis, which mediates random integration. The second approach is a vector system that uh, would allow for targeted integration into pre-selected sites using, uh, using HDR. We also used our vectors for transient expression of gene editing enzymes, CRISPR-Cas9 base editors and zinc finger nucleases, uh, for CRISPR, for the CRISPR system, we often would put multiple uh, guide RNAs into one vector to achieve an additive effect. Um, in the context of our vector, it is important to control the duration of CRISPR or Cas9 activity because it can cause uh, apoptosis, uh, specifically in primitive hemopoietic stem cells, uh, or it can cause large genomic rearrangements uh, by deletion between an off-target site and the target site. So uh, you want to make sure that CRISPR is expressed only as short as possible. And we have done this by microRNA regulation and by uh, FLIP-E recombination. I will show this later. And we have generated data in a number of mouse models, for, uh, including models for beta thalassemia, sickle cell disease, hemophilia, A and spontaneous cancer. So a typical um, 
gene addition vector using Sleeping Beauty transposes for uh, uh, hemoglobinopathies would contain a gamma globin gene, which can substitute a mutated beta, uh, usually under control of a mini LCR for erythroid specific expression, and also include an MGMT gene. So this transposon is flanked by inverted repeats and uh, FRT sites. A second vector co-injected would express flip recombinase and the sleeping beauty. So the flip recombinase would circleize this transposon here, and then uh, sleeping beauty would integrate it randomly into TA nucleotides into the chromosome. Uh, in a couple of studies, we uh, mapped all the integration sites uh, at 16 weeks after in vivo transduction, and we found a close to random integration pattern, which is theoretically safer than uh, the, the integration pattern of Lenti or AV vectors, which have a preference for active genes or promoters. Uh, this shows a, a therapy study in uh, thalassemia mice. Uh, again, in vivo transduction, selection, uh, these are gamma globin levels on RBCs, and you can see here that even without the vivo selection, we get uh, about 20 to 30 percent marking, uh, which probably is, is due that uh, gene corrected cells have a proliferative advantage. But as soon as we do the in vivo selection, we go up to 100 percent in some of these mice. And this results in a phenotypic correction on all levels, blood, bone marrow, and spleen. However, the level of gamma globin compared to adult uh, uh, mouse globin in this case is only 10%. Uh, in order to cure more severe forms of thalassemia and sickle cell disease, uh, we would need about 20% of gamma uh, relative to adult. So one way to achieve this is to replace this mini LCR here that is also currently used in all lenti globin vectors with a longer LCR uh, that stretches about 26 KB. And uh, after in vivo transduction of mice, uh, this would result in, in, in higher levels of, of gamma globin, which are, would be, which are close, close to curative levels now. Another way to, uh, to achieve this is to combine a gene addition, our gene addition unit, with a unit that would reactivate uh, uh, endogenous gamma globin, which is expressed in adults. And this would be done by a CRISPR, and the CRISPR would knock out repressor sites for gamma globin. One of these repressor sites is in the gamma globin promoter itself. So this is the corresponding guide RNA. We have placed this CRISPR unit uh, into a, in a way that it would be lost after flip recombination, so quickly after co-injection uh, CRISPR expression is gone, and this resulted in an increase of survival of genome-edited long-term repopulating cells and higher um, uh, editing rates. This shows the level of gamma globin by flow. Uh, again, we reach 100% marking, and importantly, the level of gamma globin is higher, so in a range of 40%, so way above the level that we would need in the combined system compared to the uh, gene addition and gene reactivation system alone. So we developed a vector then to be tested in a monkey, uh, in, re in rhesus macaques. We also threw in a second guide RNA against the second repressor site because we have previously seen that by combining these two guide RNAs we can get an additive effect in terms of gamma uh, globin reactivation. So we are looking at safety here. This is a six-month study. We do sequence as much as we can, and our efficacy readout, readouts would be uh, human gamma globin. This is the gene from the gene addition unit, and the rhesus gamma globin from the reactivation unit. Uh, this is an in vitro study to show that our vector really does what it's supposed to do. Uh, we transduce rhesus CD34 plus cells. We subject them to erythroid differentiation and in vitro selection, and then we measure uh, gamma globin 18 days later uh, by HPLC, and we see 100% uh, uh, of gamma uh, compared to beta, so much more than we actually need. So this is the ongoing uh, 
uh, research study, we slightly modified the mobilization scheme. We also decided to give a split dose of uh, our vector. Uh, mobilization works. Uh, at the peak of mobilization, we would give uh, inject our vector here. And with each vector injection, the percentage of uh, marked CD34 plus cells would go up to about 80% again. And then it goes down because they go back to the bone marrow. This is a, a, an analysis of the bone marrow for uh, GFP. Again, our vector contains GFP too. I forgot to mention this, but uh, in addition to gamma globin. And we are looking here at a, a subfraction uh, that is thought to contain true hemopoietic stem cells. It's a very small subfraction within the bone marrow. And we are getting transduction of about 3.2 uh, or 3.3 or 3.4 percent. Uh, at day three and day eight, so it remains stable over time as it looks now. And I mean, these numbers look relatively low, but you have to consider that we are targeting the right cells. I mean, within these billions of bone marrow cells, you have only 20,000 true hemopathic stem cells. And these are the cells that you have to hit. I mean, everything else is, is, is irrelevant. So we see the first uh, efficacy readouts here. We are looking at gamma globin or, uh, uh, on uh, circulating red blood cells on different days before treatment at day three and day eight, which was two days ago. And we see already 10% of RBCs expressing gamma globin, which is a, is a good starting point, I think, considering that we do not even have started with in vivo selection, which will uh, occur at week four. So let, let's go back to, uh, to mice. Uh, the random integration pattern of Sleeping Beauty transposes is of some concern. So we decided to develop a system that would target uh, our transgene into a so-called safe harbor. These are usually low-sided that are far away from all critical genes, and they are usually in an open chromatin uh, conformation. So one of these loci is AVS1. So, uh, and our system con uh, 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 consists of two vectors again, a CRISPR-Cas9 vector that would cut, create double strand breaks within AVS1, and double strand breaks uh, stimulate uh, HDR. And we also, for the first time, use the helper-dependent vector as a donor vector. And to create free DNA ends, we uh, inserted uh, AVS1 CRISPR-Cas9 uh, uh, recognition sites. And this would release our transgene cassette and again stimulate uh, uh, homologous uh, targeted integration. These are some data on the left side uh, in vitro data where we transduced human CD34 plus cells and analyzed pro uh, progenitor colonies for targeted integration, and every single colony showed targeted integration. This slide here shows that expression level after targeted integration is higher compared to uh, a random integration because apparently here some of the integrated vector copies are silenced. So targeting your integration into an active, constitutively active chroma, uh, uh, chromatin site uh, clearly increases uh, expression levels. And we see this immediately at the, uh, if you look at in vivo now, here after in vivo transduction, if you look at gamma levels, we reach about 25% of adult uh, uh, globin, again, this would be curative. So a few words about another application. The idea behind this here is to use the sheer numbers of hemopoietic stem cells derived, uh, of red blood cells derived from hemopoietic stem cells, and the extremely efficient uh, uh, erythropoiesis to produce therapeutic proteins that would normally not be produced in erythroid cells. Uh, and the example I'm going to show is factor eight, but this approach can be expanded to other diseases, including enzymes that are currently used in, in ERT, uh, cardiovascular diseases, viral infections. I think this is the only relevant slide I have here for HIV, for expression of, of, of decoys or broadly neutralizing antibodies or for immunotherapy of cancer. So what you see here is a blood vessel, a liver blood vessel, and erythrocytes uh, that are green. And uh, what we did here, we transduced in vivo uh, 
Mice with a vector that had the GFP gene under uh, this mini LCR for erythroid specific expression. So, what happens here is that in erythroid cells, you act, as long as they are on the bone marrow and have a nucleus, you express your protein. But then, once they leave the bone marrow and lose their nucleus, the protein is still stored inside these uh, erythrocytes. And we have shown later that it's slowly released uh, in the natural process of senescence of, uh, of erythrocytes, very similar to hemoglobin. And the protein that comes out from these senescent uh, erythrocytes is still functional. This is shown here uh, in our study with a human factor 8 vector. Uh, again, it's under erythroid-specific LCR. We do in vivo transduction in normal mice, and we measure by ELISA uh, factor eight levels. It's a bioengineered form of factor eight called ET3. We re reach physiological levels or even supraphysiological levels in, in mice. And if we played uh, colonies at week 20, uh, cells for colony assays at week 24, we see that every single colony contains an integrated vector copy. So again, the system is highly efficient, especially after in vivo selection. This is a study in hemophilia A mice, where we show that uh, we can store factor eight in, in erythrocytes. We still see production of, uh, of antibodies. But in spite of this, we see a, a phenotypic correction. We get a correction of the bleeding defect. And we think that has something to do with the fact that uh, erythrocytes store factor VIII and they are part of the blood clot and they release it, uh, uh, triggering an efficient coagulation. Okay, this is the last slide. In spite of this high level of factor VIII, uh, uh, there are, there are no abnormalities in hemopoiesis or uh, uh, red blood cell morphology. We see also a phenotypic correction in secondary recipients, which are of uh, hemophilia mice. Uh, our current vector is at, uh, at 535 plus plus. We are moving into a new vector system that is completely derived from at 35 and would not be neutralized by pre existing at 5 immunity anymore. This is a short summary. I think I uh, pointed out most things. I mean, it's applicable for HIV therapy. And I would like to thank all the people and collaborators, especially Hans Peter and uh, uh, the Gates Foundation for supporting the monkey studies. Thanks, Andre. Maybe just one short question, and then the rest of the questions can be asked uh, during the uh, break. Uh, after direct injection, very inefficiently. Again, the, the level of CD46 on multiforentiated cells is, is lower. We are looking now whether but, we can... Um, sorry, did you compare the expression of CD46 on non-stimulated CD34 yes. versus the mobilized? It's higher, right? On the it's, it's about 100 fold higher. 100 higher. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.